Great. Well, good afternoon. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into this afternoon's session. Lord Jesus, we want to come before you this afternoon. We give you thanks that you are a God who is in control, that you know the beginning from the end. There is nothing, Father, that surprises you or takes you aback. And Father, we ask that as we go through this session this afternoon, that you give us wisdom, clarity of thought, that we would walk away from here challenged and hopefully further equipped to be salt and light in this dark world. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Man as God. A heavy topic? Yes. We're living in sobering times? No question. If you want something light and easy, you came to the wrong place this afternoon, and I make no apology for it. Because we are indeed living in challenging times, we then need to dig into what it is that is moving us in that direction. And so this afternoon, I'm hoping when it's done, you're going to walk away going, ha, oh, I feel overwhelmed by the material. And yet at the same time, I'm hoping that there's something here that you take out, a thread of thought, a, continue, a continuization of thought from beginning to end. And as we go through this session, you'll realize how this works. Man as God, living the first lie. Here is the passage that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this. In fact, I hope this repeats over the course of the next few days because it is true. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new. Nothing that I will present here today will be new because at its heart, at the core of it, it comes from a similar source. It comes from the same point of view. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 is absolutely true. Nothing new under the sun. Well, in 1999, I had a chance to go to a New Age event. It was a meeting of occult leaders and New Age practitioners. And when I go to events like this, I like to sit in a, a location where I can tape record it well, because I tape record all my sessions, all the places I go to, tape record it well, and yet be close enough to an exit sign so I can vamoose if all of a sudden things get a little bit strange. But I was in a bad spot. I couldn't get good sound, and so I sat fairly close up to the front. And then, as the day progressed, one of the speakers said, get up, everybody rise, and form a circle and hold hands. And I'm like, oh no, I am too far from the exit. This isn't going to work. And I ended up holding hands in this big circle, and it was explained to us that energy would infuse this circle. And all I was doing is praying, Lord, this is not a good place. I don't like it. And as we were gathered in this big ring, a, a singer stepped into the center and started singing to us. And this is some of the song lyrics. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Sounds like an evangelical song, doesn't it? I am I am. I am the Word of God. I am the Lamb. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am holy, holy Lord. God, Al God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I am that I am. When this song was complete, the organizer stepped back into the middle of the circle and said, The Christ within me salutes, honors, and respects the Christ within each and every one of you. At that point, hands dropped and everybody bowed to each other as deities. And I stood there, numb by what I was witnessing. What I had just witnessed was a, an actual, you could say, an actual resurrection of Genesis. Primarily, Genesis chapter 3. This was the living of the first lie, the big lie, the original lie. Flip open to your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And we need to read these verses. Actually, we'll read verse 6 as well. Because this is it. This is where it starts. This is where everything really starts. When we want to understand deception, when we want to understand the way the world is moving. Genesis 3, 1 to 5. 1 to 6, pardon me. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first lie. This is the great deception. Notice some of the Luciferian tactics that take place in this passage. There's a focus on doubt. Did God really say, did he really say that to you? And then there's an alternative. You will not die. You will live. Indeed, you will live forever. And then there's the offer of almost a form of Gnosticism. In, in, in essence, it is the first Gnostic promise that there will be salvation through knowledge, special spiritual knowledge. You will be as God, knowing good and evil. You will be as God. What are the implications? They are huge. In essence, it says that God is keeping you from everything that you're supposed to be. Almost sounds like a Nike or a, a commercial of some kind, doesn't it? You're being kept back from who you truly are. You are being kept in the dark. In the occult version, the occult view of it, and yes, the occult actually has a view of Genesis. The occult version says this. Yahweh is jealous, vindictive, restrictive. He is holding you down. He is keeping you in chains. He is keeping you in bondage. He is keeping you ignorant. Whereas the Luciferian perspective is one of enlightenment, illumination, intellect, a gift of knowledge, choice. That is the occult interpretation of Genesis chapter 3. Interestingly, when you go through some of the occult literature of the day, and even the occult literature that goes back a hundred years, you find interesting titles like Lucifer, the light bearer, Lucifer, Gnosis, even this idea of a true science of light. Indeed, the occult is nothing more than the science of Luciferic light. And so this is at the core of what is taking place in Genesis chapter 3. The Luciferic being comes and says, you can be as God. You can be as God. Reminds me of Proverbs 14, verse 12. And I pity the man who stops at the stop sign. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So true. It's a dead end. It stops. It's finished. It leads to death. Yet, we have been defiant. Yet mankind at our hearts, in our hearts, we are defiant creatures. Reminds me of Shirley MacLaine. Some of you here, I'm sure, remember seeing Shirley MacLaine's miniseries, Out on a Limb. And do you remember when she stood at the beach with her friend and she had her arms spread and she was saying, I am God. And her friend countered and stood beside her parallel and said, I am God. And the two of them go back and forth, back and forth, making this proclamation. Shirley MacLaine is getting older. She pays bills. She has wrinkles. I am sure that she has bad days. Not the kind of God that I think I'll follow. You get my drift. And yet, this is the lie revisited over and over again. This is the heart of Mormonism. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. It's also the secret of Freemasonry. Joseph Fort Newton. Here lies the great secret of Masonry, that it makes a man aware of that divinity within him. And Manly P. Hall, one of the most important Masonic scholars of the last century, said this, Man is a god in the making, and as in the mystic myths of Egypt, on the potter's wheel he is being molded. When his light shines out to lift and preserve all things, he receives the triple crown of godhood. J.D. Buck, a member of the Masonic Lodge 
a Masonic scholar, a Masonic historian, and also a member of the Theosophical Society, wrote this, a very telling statement. It is far more important that men should strive to become Christ than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. Jesus is no less divine because all men may reach the same divine perfection. I'm waiting for lightning bolts on that one. Theosophy, started by this happy-looking lady, Blavatsky, and followed up by Annie Besant and Alice Bailey and many others since then, teaches the same thing. It has as its core the same philosophy. Theosophy is the mother of the New Age movement. Theosophy is a combination of the teachings of Freemasonry, Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Western-based occultism. It meshes it together. It brings it all together into a new mystical way of looking at life. And it's called Theosophy. And when you hear about the New Age movement, and you hear the term thrown around, think Theosophy, because that is its roots. This is what Annie Besant said. Man is not to be compelled. He is to be free. He is not a slave, but a God in the making. Genesis chapter 3. In the New Age, nothing can touch me but the direct action of God, and God is my omnipotent self. I can do all things through the strength of the Christ I am. I am strong.